we've reached a magical number of 100 participants. So that, that's as good as a uh, moment to get started as any. Uh, my name is Wei Ti Ma. I'm the founder of the Growing Up in Science series, which has um, had um, many local uh, instantiations. But what you're attending here is the global series um, where we try to highlight scientist stories from all of, over the world uh, in, uh, in a holistic way. The Growing Up in Science uh, series was started with the idea of humanizing uh, what happens in academia and uh, especially bring out the struggles and doubts and detours that um, established scientists uh, take on the way to where they are now. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I'd, I'd love to talk to all 113 of you, but uh, by lack of for lack of time, uh, I'd, I'd rather ask you to introduce yourself briefly in the chat. So just write, write a few sentences about who you are, where you are, and maybe why you're here, if you like. Um, and then I'm going to hand things over to the moderator of the day, which is uh, Veronica Carafini. Vero, Vero uh, was a postdoc in cancer research at the University of Cambridge and is now a project advisor in the life sciences for the European Commission. Vero. Thank you so much, Beiji. And hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's talk. I'm very happy to have David here with us today, and I'm pretty sure we are all looking forward to his talk. So I'm just going to take one minute to introduce him, and then I let him talk. So David uh, is an adjunct professor at Stanford University and works at the Meta Reality Labs. And just to give you a brief idea of what his work is, is working on developing brain machine interfaces and studying how cells in our brain give rise to the computations that determine our behavior. David was very nice to agree to give a talk today. And if you already had a look at his uh, uh, unofficial story, I think it's going to be an amazing talk. And if not, uh, well, you're in for a good surprise for sure. David also agreed to answer questions even during his talk. Uh, so you can raise your hand. Uh, we can give you the floor and you can ask the question. Otherwise, you can wait till uh, at the end of the talk or you can also write your question in the chat, of course, and we can read it out loud or give you the floor uh, later. Uh, after this, I leave the floor to David and uh, please tell us your story. Great. Thank you, Vera. Thank you, Weiji. Uh, Y'all can hear me? This is working? We're all good? Okay, great. So, um, yeah, just a, a couple, just a little bit of preamble. Um, I'm I'm giving this talk in a personal capacity, and I'm not speaking today about my work at Meta Reality Labs. Um, a little bit more, uh, if I mention names, it'll come up. I've changed some names. Um, uh, you may see me cry a little bit, but, uh, you know, I typically it almost already happened because I'm so pleased to see all the people here and so many people that I recognize. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, you may see me curse. I curse like a sailor and um, it's a bad habit and I don't do it in my academic talks, but it may come out here. I'll try to keep it to a dull roar. Um, I have a, a little bit of family here and potentially some people from uh, Milton Hershey School and the Albuquerque Christian Children's Home. I just want to acknowledge them and thank them for showing up. Great. All right. So um, is there any way, I guess, if the chat just keeps coming up, I'll just, I should just ignore that, right? The little pop-ups. Yes. These okay. are people introducing themselves. So. Okay. Okay. Yep. Sure. So then I won't monitor the chat at all. Great. As, uh, perfect. As we talk. So yeah, uh, as I wrote in my, um, in my unofficial story, my parents were both heroin addicts. And, um, you know, they were good people, but they were seriously flawed. Um, and so what that meant practically uh, for my sister and I is that we ended up living in, in institutionalized living facilities in, in group homes. We call that, it's, it's an orphanage basically, right? You just don't hear the word orphanage anymore because most people don't go to orphanages, they go to uh, foster care, right? People have, the system has sort of figured out that orphanages are a really bad idea. Um, so uh, I lived with some of my aunt and uncles for a while. And then I, I, I lived in high school at the Milton Hershey School. Uh, so what I thought I would do, you know, through uh, anyone's life, I think you could tell a bunch of different narratives here. 
And um, given the, the 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 nature of this talk and and the audience in particular, this is the uh, neuroscience crowd, an academic audience. I thought I'd sort of weave the story of sort of how I got into academics and uh, and all of that. So, but I'll I'll start early and I'll just sort of work chronologically. I think it's the right way to go here. Um, so yeah, my my parents uh, were drug addicts and. In uh, my my uh, my kindergarten year, they um, they got into a uh, sorry. I'm just gonna you know I might just minimize here. There's something going on with somebody who's shared their screen, so I should be just disabling that. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, so they got into a huge fight um, and ultimately were divorced uh, because of that. And so I went, uh, my sister and I went to live with my mother. Uh, well, we were already living with my mother, excuse me. We lived with our mother alone. I, I didn't really see my father much after that. Um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, I grew up in Albuquerque uh, for the most part, we, but we lived for a year, my second grade year in, Al in Santa Fe, which is a beautiful mountain town right at the nexus of the desert and the mountains there. And, uh, you know, there I really met my first best friend, a kid by the name of Shiloh. And, uh, you know, he and I were uh, totally just uh, kind of out of control. I right? really had no supervision. So, you know, everything from like, stealing in the Kmarts to starting fires to all things like kids would do except you know a, you know extra uh you know so but the thing is we really um we really got into uh video games so for me without a doubt video games were was the was the thing that first got my mind going there's no doubt about it uh you know because you know oh, video games rot your mind not my mind nah -uh um i was stimulated by them they presented a world that made sense um and probably some uh, fair amount of escapism going on you know but we could never find a quarter because you know i was very poor uh it poor in a way that i think is hard for many americans to understand like you know crushing poverty where you know you 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 get a food stamp once a month and you like make the you make the the quarters last kind of thing right so um so we got really good at the video games because we were forced to get really good at the video games and so you know between that friendship uh and and uh playing those games i think my mind started going in a specific direction right um after that year um uh, my mother moved back to albuquerque and shiloh actually ended up moving to a little town in the ortiz mountains called madrid uh this little little we should go there sometime anyways so now i'm in my third grade year and i'm I, we moved to this neighborhood um called the war zone okay and so it's uh these days it's uh, i think uh more politically correct called the international uh neighborhood but it was um crime ridden drug ridden very very unsafe and you know i'm eight years old so i don't really know what's going on right uh so but um at that time you know, my mother's mental health was uh, degrading rapidly. She was addicted to either methadone or heroin. And um, she uh, really just wasn't able to take care of us. So, you know, that first that first uh, year, my mother didn't enroll us in school, right? Uh, so we, we actually got a knock on the door from a couple of teachers. I'm not quite sure how they caught wind of it. But like, hey, time to go to school. Okay, so we start going to school. And um, this was, you know, the first time that I got a hint that there was this thing called being smart. Um, so two things happened. Ah, see, it's the gratitude that always gets me. Um, uh, two things happened. One is 
my third grade teacher, I was, I, you have to understand, I, I basically had no rules as a kid, right? I had no boundaries. So my behavior was by normal standards, very, very poor. So my teacher figured out that if, if he made me the tutor in the class, then it was kind of a win-win, right? Because he, he doesn't have to discipline me. I'm not bored and I'm doing something productive. So that happened. And then the other thing that happened where this, I, I believe my memory is that the same teachers that came and uh, sort of got me and my sister to go to school, uh, they, in, they helped us with the science fair. There was, you know, science fairs are basically, um, let's face it, it's the organizational capacity fair, right? It's, it's the parents get involved fair and my parents weren't there to do that. So I was definitely gonna fail the, the science fair, but we got involved with these um, teachers and um, I did like the classic one of like you put the different nails in the vinegar and you see which ones uh, disintegrate. Uh, so that um, I won, actually. And so did my sister uh, for fourth and third grade. So um, that was my first exposure to science. I thought it was cool. It's like, you know, messing around with things. It was fun. It was it was there were mysteries. And, you know, there was there was discovery to be had. Uh, so. Um, yeah, so that, that was what sort of got me into, um, thinking about science. My first exposure, I wasn't thinking about anything. I was just a dumb eight year old. Um, so, uh, there, during that year, my mother's health really went downhill and, um, she actually had a friend come take care of us and she was taking a break. As it turned out, she was taking a break in a mental health institution for uh, serious depression. So, um, that was cool because the, the new surrogate, she was a pretty good surrogate mom and it worked out for a few days, a few weeks. And then I started to get into trouble like I always did. So I decided to one day to run away. I wasn't really serious about it. I just wanted to go play video games and blow off some steam and maybe give this woman a fright, you know? Um, well, it worked. She did get frightened. And um, so she called my grandparents and the next thing you know, my sister and I that night are in the Albuquerque Christian Children's Home. Um, so, so let me tell you about this. This is, you know, um, to live in one of these uh, facilities is it, it's one of those, you just gotta be there kind of things, but let me give it a shot, you know? So, uh, let me just describe it. What is it like? The Albuquerque Christian children's home in the eighties was right on the edge of the desert. There were three houses. They were big honking ranch style houses, brick houses. Each one could hold like 16 kids. A, a wing for the house parents, house parents is what you call somebody who actually is um, in, who, who runs one of these houses, right? Uh, the sort of surrogate parents. Um, so, you know, and from, from uh, any given day, it, th there could be as little as six kids to as many as 16. When I was there, it was a very crowded place. So we were there usually on the higher end from 10 to 16 in each student home. So that it multiply by three because there's cottage one, cottage two, and cottage three, sort of uh, very, very creatively named. So um, what's it like to be in a group home? Um, you know, the, the way I like to say it is the first rule of living in a group home is you don't talk about living in a group home. We went to public school, you know, so uh, we were really embarrassed by it. And so like Albuquerque Christian Children's Home, that's nine syllables. And people know what the hell you're talking about, right? So then there is the group home. That's three. Okay, you're doing better. We also said ACCH. Um, and then we just finally shortened it to like the home, right? So, but we never said home and we, ne we didn't live home. We lived at the home and it was the, 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 the was that preposition was, was the whole universe, right? The whole world. Uh, so we were really embarrassed about it. And we knew that there was a difference between us and the kids at school. Uh, the other thing about living in a group home is, um, you know, I'm eight years old, right? It's it really hard to put yourself back into this type of scenario, right? Um, you're just alone right? House parents are uh, necessary, well-meaning people doing, in the ACCH's case, literally doing God's work, right? It is a Christian organization to handle orphans on the streets of Albuquerque. Um, but you know what? They're not your parents. And with a 16 to 1 uh, kid to, uh, well, I guess it's 8 to 1, but basically, let's say 16 to 1 mother to kid ratio. Uh, well, you understand what I mean. Um, 
that you just there's just not there's no attention right so you effectively live emotionally alone right and um there is uh sort of no way to describe that except to experience it as a child so you think okay hey i was you know i got lost in the, in the mall once cool well you wouldn't get lost for two days and then okay four days try a week you know how much you feel what about two weeks a month a year two years i was in the albuquerque christian children's home for five years right so from from eighth grade till basically 13. um so being there is basically like just kind of not quite Lord of the Flies from the perspective of a boy in a group home, right? The, the house pants are there to make thing, make sure things don't go full on. Piggy gets a rock in his head. But beyond that, it's pretty wild. Um, so that was kind of the, the milieu I was in. And I got to tell you, circling back to the sort of the theme of the talk here, you're just not concerned about intellectual things. That's not where your mind is at right? It's, it's as far away as you could imagine. Um, so, um, but there were some very positive things that happened at the Albuquerque Christian Children's Home. Um, I discovered the library. You know, I, I, I have no memory of ever reading a book before I discovered the library, thanks to one of my uh, house mothers, uh, Tina Lujan. Um, and so it was like, whoa, you know, there's, there's books, there's stories, there's, there's, there's fantasies, you can get away. And, you know, like, I remember reading uh, you know, Wrinkle in Time, you know, just like, <sighs> my hair is totally blown back by this book. And just thinking that excuse me, that there are other possibilities, right, that there's a world. And so I found the library. Um, and then I got tested for the gifted and talented program. And again, I didn't know that I was smart, right? I didn't know, I didn't know what that meant, but apparently my teachers did because they took me to get the test and I passed. So all of a sudden I'm in classes that are completely different. Instead of being a complete shithead in my fifth grade class, you know, just bothering all the kids and being completely out of control. Now I'm in a place where like, hey, let's talk about probability theory, right? I mean, it was, it was like, you know, kids pulling candy candies out of their Halloween treats. Right? I was all dressed up for kids, but like, it was a very different vibe. It was thinking about thinking, right? It was metacognition, it was outlines. And I think that, I think that really helped me uh, structure my thought, right? Because I promise you, I wasn't thinking about math, you know? I was, who knows where my head was at, right? I, to be honest with you, I don't really remember where my head was at. The other thing that happened was exposure to programming. Um, it was a really early memory, actually. I um, I think I might've been like five or six and I'm like in a Kmart, right? And they, back, we're talking about like 1980, right? So they had the trash 80, the TRS 80 computer and some teenagers like hacking away and it's like a little basic, you know, 10, blah, 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 20, blah, blah, blah. So I have this memory where I walk up to this guy and um, he's like, what's your name, kid? So I'm like, David, and like 10, print David, you know, 20, go to 10. He's like, you see, this is your name and this is going to go up there. And I think I understood it. You know, like it was a very simple program. But the point is, you see that there's an algorithm, there's a recipe, there's a thing that's going to happen, right? And you run and brrr, David is cool, David is cool, David is cool, David is cool. And I, you know, I was just really like blown away by that. And so between that and video games, I was really into computers. We didn't have a computer at the home, but, you know, we had the Apple IIEs at work, excuse me, at um, we at school. And so we'd have the computer lab like twice a week or something. And I always get that little note pinned to my shirt that was like, David refuses to share computer with lab mate please talk to David about the value of sharing. <laughs> right? so how could I share? I wasn't going to share that. Are you kidding me? Um, so, so there were some positive things that happened. And, you know, one of, one of the alumni of the ACCH, a guy named Dana, he was actually getting a degree from, um, from UNM, University of New Mexico there in Albuquerque. 
And uh, so he actually, you know, took me under his wing for a little bit and gave me this book on Pascal. But, you know, one of the things one of the things that happens in, in these group homes, and, and I think this is true, probably of volunteerism in general, is like people get interested and then they go away. So like we had a karate instructor, we had a piano instructor, we had a program instruct programmer instructor all for a month. Right. So like I didn't really ever learn any of it. Um, so th those are some of the experiences I had around, um, ar around, by the way, the, the thing with the, with the gifted and talented, that changed my perception. I became aware that smart was a thing. I became aware that I had this thing and that it had really far reaching uh, implications for my future. Uh, and I don't know where I inherited that. I just, it just kind of happened. Right. So, um, the other thing that was going on in the Albuquerque Christian Children's Home for me was that, uh, well, let's just say the the Albuquerque Christian, the Christian is no bullshit in ACCH. So we were going to church three times a week, daily devotionals, you know, like everything, Sunday school, full school, Sunday night, devotionals during the day, go Wednesday night. So I very much uh, believed in in the religion I was being taught. Uh, and in a way that was um, probably contradictory with the science I was being taught in school, right? There was creationism and all the rest of it in, in, in the, in the, at the ACCH. And so I would bring it up with my my um, with my pastor. I'd be like, hey, well, what about the dinosaurs and seven days? Does that really buttoned up in seven days? Like, so we'd have these back and forth. And so I was, I think I was starting to think critically, you know, Um so by the time I was in fifth fifth grade here, um, I started realizing that uh, my situation was pretty dire. And uh, so, you know, maybe I'm 10 or I'm probably 10 to 11 at this point. And, you know, the first thing that happened was I had an existential crisis. I really did. I, um, I realized we were all going to die. and There's nothing we could do about it. And it was, it was the talking heads you know, the band, like, we're on a road to nowhere. I won't, I won't sing because that's terrible. But like, uh, you know, I'm on the road to nowhere. And like, if you go look at that video, that video is a near perfect, it's not perfect, but it's a very good description of what the ACCH was right on the edge of a town in a, in a, in at the edge of a desert, right? And here's this guy going, I'm on a road to nowhere, walking down the street of a, of, a, of a long highway in the middle of a desert. And I'm like, shit, that's me, right? So I go, I, I start having like legitimate panic attacks, right? And uh, they last about six months. And, you know, because again, there's no one there, right? Am I really going to tell my my house parents? I'm, I, wouldn't, I don't even have the vocabulary. I don't even know what a panic attack is, Right. I'm just like freaking out about I'm going to die someday. Um, so that actually uh, came to an end because my aunt and uncle, uh, Laura and Ben, ended up coming to visit us at the group home. And we had this wonderful trip together. And as a result of that, my sister and I started going out to the East Coast, which would be uh, it would be a pivotal uh, change in my life. So, um, so the other thing that happened, this, you know, I'm having these like wild emotions all the time, right? Like just completely, you know, I'm like in full on rages and like my emotions are just out of control. The other thing that happened was I ended up having a roommate, kind of, uh, a Mexican American kid by the name of Miguel, who was, uh, you know, 13, I was probably 10. So like about three years older than me, right? I, he would have been, let's say a senior when I was a freshman, if, if I had stayed there that long. Um, and, you know, at first he, he just kind of kicked the crap out of me, but we eventually became friends. And, uh, you know, he was like a legit street tough off, off, off the uh, streets. You know, he, he'd actually gotten busted for doing something by the cops. And, and the judge was like, you either get to go to juvie hall or the ACCH. And so he chose the ACCH. So we ended up becoming uh, really good friends when he wasn't beating the shit out of me. And, um, you know, I brought it up to him one day. I was like, you know, like, what are we going to do, man? Like we are screwed because you can just see, right? Like you can just see it. Like I'm going to 
at this point, I guess I was still in, in grammar school in, in fifth grade, but like I'm going to school. I see I'm starting to get a picture that like I don't know what normal is like, but I'm pretty sure that this ain't it. Right. So, um, you know, we start brainstorming like, you know, well, what are you going to do? Right. And I just remember it because we, you know, uh, Miguel had this hip hop tape of like old school rap, like uh, Melly Mel and UTFO and the real Roxanne and, and Houdini, you know. And so we just put this this mixtape of uh, hip hop on and just like I guess it was called rap back in the day. But we would put that on and we would like brainstorm what to do. And, you know, like basically what we the conclusions we came to was like, well, Dave, you're a smart kid. There's this thing called college and you're going to go to college on a scholarship. Okay. And then we bring like, well, what about you, Miguel? You know, well, I'm not that smart actually. Okay. Uh, well, you know, you're kind of a leader. We all follow you around the group home the entire day. So, uh, you know, what about that internship you heard about at Coca-Cola? Okay. So he's going to go his, he's going to go up the corporate ladder, get at some kind of entry level job, you know, hauling, hauling Cokes basically. Um, so, you know, people often ask me, well, like, you know, when did you know, like, how did, how, how did you, how did you, how did you do this? And I got to tell you, it was through conversations with another kid. It really was, you know, I had a lot of support from aunts and uncles, especially later. Um, but the, if I look back at the seed of like, when did I stop despairing about my situation? It was those conversations. Um, so uh, then what happened is, uh, so I spent another couple more uh, years in the ACCH. And my mother is um, in and out of the psych ward, basically, right? And it's, you know, it sounds like a strange thing to say, but because, you know, my mother cared, she was trying, right? She was just very, very sick with a lot of problems in life, you know, because she's around, like my aunts and uncles are feeling like, well, they can't really get involved because there's a mother there and the mother is still trying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, when in seventh, my mother actually passed away in seventh grade, right? So um, from kind of the set of problems you would imagine somebody who lived that lifestyle and, and having this, the, the set of issues that she had. So I, I was totally taken back. I, I was not expecting her to pass away. Uh, so it was this huge shock. And uh, sort of once again, I went back into some kind of anxiety driven perspective on life um, and sort of having panic attacks again. But like this time, it was like not just it was more um, like almost dissociation, like just getting a little fuzzy, you know, uh, just a little weird. So that lasted for probably the entirety of my seventh grade year. And uh, my my grades were horrific. I mean, I, I just I was as troubled as a kid as you could be without actually like at that point, I wouldn't say I had um, I had inherited my problems. You know, I hadn't become yet even aware enough, really, to say have responsibility for the things that were happening to me in terms of my own behavior. Um, so, yeah, my mother passes away and some of my aunts and uncles, uh, my uncle James and Aunt Beverly, they um, they they step in. Right. So um, they agree. Well, they asked me, hey, do you want to, I had went to visit them. Actually, they were, they were newlyweds. I went to visit them at their wedding the year before, because we were going in the summer times to, uh, to the East coast. And so he called me up. I was like, Hey, you, you know, you want to come live with us. And I was like, fuck yes, I do. I am out of here. Um, but so, you know, it was, it was, they, they were newlyweds. It was an offer for me. Uh, my sister uh, did not have that offer. Uh, so she ended up going to a boarding school in um, in upstate New York, and uh, I ended up going to Milnhurst School ultimately. So um, very briefly, I moved to Virginia uh, and spent a year with my aunt and uncle. And um, you know, I, I was a handful. It didn't work out. Uh, I just I just was too much for them. Right. So. Uh, but, you know, circling back to the uh, the intellectual portion of it, like I go into this new place. I'm like, you know, I had hit the intellectual jackpot. I mean, there's like 
There's magazines on the table, right? That you can actually read things. There was there was like Discover Magazine and Scientific American. I'll admit at eighth grade, Scientific American was a little above me. But the Discover was magazine was just right, man. I would read that thing forward to back and back to forward, and I'd do all the puzzles. And you know, like I think those magazines um got me realizing that there were these like institutions of learning. You know, it wasn't just UNM, there was like a Caltech and like an MIT and Stanford. And there the sort of wizards of of science would concoct fabulous brews and all of a sudden technologies would happen. And like, I was captivated by it, you know? And I think what was going on, sort of hindsight, you know, is that due to the neglect I experienced, once I found out there was this thing called smart and I had it, I really fixated on that portion of, of myself, right? Because that was my ticket, right? It was my, it was the thing that made me special. And when nobody's telling you they love you, you got to figure out a way to tell yourself you love you, right? That's just fucking reality. So um, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of how I really started thinking about what would it mean to be a scientist? And there was, there was a little bit of a battle because I had all this religion, but in the end of the day, you see here I am in this, in this venue. So the science won out. Um, so let me just have a, a pause here. So after a year of living with my aunt and uncle, I, uh, we, we all decide that it's just not working out. So I move up to uh, this school in Hershey, Pennsylvania, Milton Hershey School. Um, let's see, 1034. I think we're doing just perfect with time. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Milton Hershey School. Um, every time you've ever eaten a Mr. Good bar, thrown back a handful of good and plenty, or marveled at the magical dynamic combination of peanut butter and chocolate, you were funding the world's largest orphanage, right? See, it's the gratitude thing. Um, so Hershey and his wife, they couldn't have kids back in the day. And this guy had money, like major money. It's like 60 or I don't even know, $100 million back in like 1906. And they left all of their money to this orphanage that they had started called, uh, I think it was called the Hershey Industrial School. And it was basically for white boys. And, you know, that's how it went back then. And then over the years, it sort of expanded it, it you know it's now that school has 15 billion dollar endowment right it's enormous it's like ivy league big and they kind of just don't know what to do with the money at this point i think but anyways that's a whole other conversation so these days the school is about so I, as far as i understand it 2000 kids um uh, across all genders, races, everything with sort of the mandate is to sort of bring kids in from Pennsylvania because that's in the charter for the school, but basically all along the Eastern seaboard and, and whatnot. So um, I ended up at this school, Milton Hershey school. Um, second. So uh, like most teenagers, I was kind of a shithead. And I don't really have a lot to say about my time at Milton Hershey School. I didn't like it. In fact, I hated it. Um, I got my ass kicked quite a bit. In fact, very badly many times. So I don't have a, a, a very positive associations to it. But I will say that um, there is a lot of different experiences at that school because it's such a large school. And I think I just sort of had the perfect storm of awful. My house father was a, not a, not a guy, nice guy. And I was small and new and all the rest of it. So I basically just, um, I tuned out for four years. I did a lot of drugs, you know, like I was huffing air duster and whippets and like really just killing brain cells at a very, very fast speed. Uh, and so if all of you who know me well know how bad my math is, blame it on the air duster in high school. <laughs> that's, uh, okay, that's funny in a weird way. Um, so, um, I basically tuned out, but um, well, I was still smart, all right? And in class, I wasn't as much of a shithead as I was out of class. And I, I managed to get pretty good grades. And so by the end of um, my senior year, well, I guess at the beginning of my senior year, I'm like in contention for uh, um, valedictorian or salutatorian, right? Like 
Um, and in the end, I didn't get the valedictorian. I lost on a home ec class of B or something. Pardon me. So, but, you know, despite four years of sort of self-medication, I, the point I want to make is that I gave myself an opportunity, right? It was still on in the cards to go to a good school. Um, so I really didn't have any, any preparation for the, the, the college process, the application process. I mean, I'm deeply sympathetic to these ideas that like, this is a stacked system. I, I, I had no idea. I, like, I just walked into the SAT and took it. Right. I had no idea that that preparation was a thing. No, none whatsoever. I got a 1310, like 700 in, in math and 610 in verbal. It was a good score. I mean, these are not the scores you need to get into an elite school, right? You need, you need to do better than that these days. Um, my college application, I, I was really excited to go to MIT. Like it was my life's goal to go to MIT at this point. Right. And um, no idea, completely beyond my wildest imagination that an essay that like meaningfully engaged with my childhood experiences might reflect well on me right no idea whatsoever and so like you know there's a little blurb and they're like literally they like back in the day i don't know what they do anymore but like there was literally lines and i'm like oh you're writing that okay so you know, you know, what do you, you know, what, what, what are you? I don't remember. It's like, what are you proud of in in your high school career? You know, what were your accomplishments? So I'm like literally in in bio with a black ballpoint pen, you know, scrawling out how I feel that my experiences in swimming were had had made me a better person. You know, <laughs> like, it was ungrammatical, it was uninteresting, and well, I didn't get accepted to MIT. Um, so. Uh, you know, but the truth of the matter is after those four years, I don't think I really deserved to be accepted there anyways. Uh, I, I wasn't really tuned in. Um, but I did get accepted at, at, to Carnegie Mellon, actually, which is a terrific school. In fact, a world-class school for a few disciplines such as um, computer science, drama, some of the engineering disciplines. And uh, I, I ultimately enrolled in, I enrolled in physics, but switched almost immediately to, to computer science. So um, despite my best efforts in high school to sort of sabotage myself, I ended up at like a world-class educational institution, especially for the discipline that I was interested in. And I have to say, most of that was just complete luck, absolute luck. There was no, nothing going on there on my mind, or as far as I could tell anyone else's mind about how to actually execute on this long-term plan to make it into MIT or whatever, however you want to call that, right? So um, when I got to CMU, uh, I really had a very big change in my perspective on life. I went from being a shithead to like taking things very seriously. Um, you know, I, I have this memory of my French teacher, my French high school teacher, like, because I was a shithead in class. I was just a terrible student, you know, uh, behaviorally. Uh, at, at Milton Hershey School, you got three grades. You got your your uh, achievement, effort, and conduct. And I was the king of the ADD. Uh, so a you know, very strange thing to get a D in effort when you get an A in, in uh, achievement. But the conduct, that was legit. So anyways, my French teacher pulls me aside and she says, you know, she, pure pure French constantly. She speaks to me in English at the end of my my senior year, and she says, "You know, Dave, you could be the cream of the cream. Just gotta fucking work." I don't think she used the f bomb. Excuse me, um, but uh, you know, you just have to work. You have to work. You're like, get with it. You know, and and I don't know what made me receptive to that message, but I'm glad she pulled me aside because it might have been the change in the language. It may have been who knows. Maybe I was just my brain was maturing. But so when I got to CMU, my mentality was completely different. I went from a pathological disinterest in everything academic or positive for who I was to almost a pathological interest in it. Because what I realized is, A, I'm free for the first time. And being in these organizations, these institutionalized facilities, that is a form of prison for kids. That's how it feels. It has to happen. I get it. it there's a reason for it. But if you, as far as the experience, I was in prison. And now I am uh, no longer in prison. Right? And I just had this overwhelming sense of possibility, an overwhelming sense of freedom. And I was going to take advantage of it. 
I, you, you better believe it. You know, I remember when my, my dorm, I ended up in the most busted dorm, all male dorm at the far end of campus, but it gave me this really great view over, over the CMU campus. I just remember like, cause you could, you had access to the roof, just looking out on the campus and like cackling, you know, like, Whoa! because, you know, it was just like a, this visceral, uh, this visceral sense of freedom, you know, like I could have flown off of that, that building. So, um, well, I started looking around in the registrar in the, in the registry for classes. And there was this class called analysis. I was really interested in math in those times. Right. So I, um, the class, they said analysis one and two theoretical underpinnings of calculus, uh, replacements for calculus one and two. Uh, and then it said, you know, only for the top students. <laughs> of course, now I have to do this, right? As like a, a moth drawn to f a flame. Because I had, a, a you know, this sense of myself that my only sense of value was through this very narrow um, d definition of intelligence. And so I enrolled for the classes, but it turns out I didn't get in. So I went and visited the, um, the, the math, uh, the math department head. And what must have been like one of the most awesome acts of self-advocacy I'd ever done into that. My point, I went and advocated for myself. So we're having this conversation in his office. And he's like, you know, I, 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 you just don't really have the prerequisites we need for you to get in these classes. And I said, well, why not? He said, well, I looked at your SAT scores. I see you saw us, you got a 700. And yeah, that's true. Well, you know, I'm embarrassed to say it, but almost every one of those kids got an 800. You, you know, like, you, you, well, I said this, so I said, sir, did you look at my, my BC calculus AP test? There's another test. Anyway, I did really well on the calc, on the calc AP exam. So, I mean, you see, I got a five. It was through self-study. So I convinced this guy to, um, to uh, let me take this class. And so now all of a sudden I'm like with like the Uber nerds, you know? And so I'm actually around Uber nerds right now. So maybe I don't have to define this, but like um, CMU, right? I mean, by any standard metric of nerdiness, my art friends at CMU were nerds. My frat friends at CMU were nerds. But I went to that like next 11 level. You know, I, I, my, we played Magic the Gathering when it first came out. You know, there was like the Society for Creative Anachronism and LARPing and all this crazy stuff going on. So it was really, really intense. And that was this, you know, I was in a bunch of different scenes. I was in the really hardcore nerd scene. I was in the frat scene. Anyways, that was kind of my experience there. And so I got into these classes and I realized very quickly as I took the classes that I was disgustingly, woefully unprepared. Everybody was smarter than me. And it was so bad that I couldn't see the difference between preparation and intelligence, right? I didn't understand that if somebody knows how to solve a first order differential equation, then they know a thing you don't know. And so it's going to look like they're geniuses until you learn how to do it yourself, right? So I had extreme anxiety about my time, my first semester, my second semester there. So I ended up talking to uh, one of my uncles, my uncle Ben, uh, a therapist, and you know he really helped me out because I was just having so much anxiety about uh, lack being underprepared. And it, so, luckily, I had that lifeline there to to reach out to. Uh, the the other thing that that I realized was that in some ways I was actually better prepared. Like I could make my bed in the morning. You know, I was I was disciplined. I didn't have a problem studying. So one of the things I didn't tell you about in, in group homes, you do like the movies got it right when it comes to chores. It is chores, 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 chores. It's, it's the people think it, first off, you have to keep the house clean. There's no money. Second off, it builds character, right? So um, I could give a whole lecture, 30 minutes on the ins and outs of uh, cleaning toilets. But for the for sake of brevity, let's just say that it, it engendered a uh, very serious work ethic in me. So I, I was taking my classes very seriously uh, and I ended up doing all right. You know, I didn't have stellar grades my first year, but they were all right. Uh, so then my, my fresh, my freshman year ends and it's my, I have a good friend, Don, who actually was raised in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, so he, he and I had really become best friends and he invited me to come live with him for the summer in Santa Fe, which was a really generous gift. I'm like, are you sure your parents are cool with this? So he's going to stay with his parents. We all stayed with his parents. They were totally cool. And so I ended up uh, scooping ice cream 
at the at the Hagen Das there in um, the Santa Fe Plaza, uh, my freshman year, uh, at the end of my freshman year. And you know that you may not may not know if you've never been to Santa Fe that Hagen Das is was for a time the most money making Hagen Das in the world because everyone goes to the plaza. So uh, because of that popularity, I ended up seeing a bunch of people from my childhood. Uh, you know, I saw Shiloh. Shiloh was begging for quarters on the street. My this was Shiloh was my first buddy from my second grade year, my best friend. And he's out there, you know, and I don't reckon I'm, I'm out there taking a break uh, in, the, in the plaza after scooping ice cream for four hours. And, you know, he's just begging for quarters. And I, he, he's like, I see this guy, I don't recognize him, right? He's, he looks like this, hard, this guy who life is done hard by, you know, and he, he sees me and like, boom, he stops begging, he gets up and he walks over to me. I have no idea who this guy is. And when he gets close enough, I recognize him. It's Shiloh, hey, how are you doing? So we end up having this like really uh, very brief conversation because it was clear to both of us that there was a gulf that could not be bridged. And uh, I have to admit that uh, the no matter what I endured, if if the you know if the evidence is in front of me, whatever Shiloh endured, it was worse. So uh, you know there are a lot of different ways to have a, a miserable life, and I I could just tell like you know Shiloh wasn't doing well. He was basically homeless. I ended up seeing my sister. Uh, I hadn't seen her because we had separated. Um, she was doing okay. She was in, in school. Um, I ended up hearing about Miguel. Uh, Miguel was actually um, potentially in very serious legal jeopardy. He found out, like, keep in mind, living in an orphanage is awful, right? He found out you can leave at 17, right? There's, there's some details to it. It's not worth going into, but so he left. And well, he got, he fell in with his old crowd. And the next thing you know, he's like, I don't know if I have it exactly, but basically like doing drive-by shootings, you know, like doing crazy stuff. And uh, he got got arrested for it or something. So this is, you know, these are the people that that I sort of were keeping track of in my in in, in my life. And it, you know, I have to say it didn't look so hot. So uh, I return to um, I return to Carnegie Mellon. And I ended up taking this other math class called math studies. It's, it's, it's the same thing, except 10 X, like two classes worth like six, six classes worth of credit. Right. I mean, it's like theory, math, all kinds of crazy thing. I'm basically cracking because I don't understand anything of what's going on, but you could just see, I, I mentioned it because you can sort of see what I was doing to maintain my sense of self-worth through like really not having any, parents you know um so junior year rolls around i end up meeting a professor who is so 1995 the internet is just beginning right and i'm at carnegie mellon and there are people thinking hard about that and so one of the professors that i uh met was thinking about basically social networking in 1995 he had an idea about making contacts and asking questions and sending them through chains of contacts and there was money exchange. Uh, it was an interesting idea in the end, you know, 25 years later in hindsight, it, it was never going to work. But, you know, he was really thinking hard about these things. And so I ended up becoming a programmer for his work. And we, uh, it was like, basically think of it as like research programming, right? And so we, I ended up building this system for him really. And that system he decided he convinced some people that there was a there there. So they built a company around it, a company called Ohm, OHM, Oracle Hive Mind, or something like this. Um, so the next thing you know, I go from like being dirt broke. By the way, I in order I got a free ride. So that's how I paid for everything, right? And then I worked full time through through college in order to not full time. I worked constantly through college in order to just have uh drink money. So now all of a sudden I go from really just watching my nickels and pennies to like. I'm actually making a salary, you know, I'm, I'm going to school and I'm working full time for this company to build this startup. And it really kind of changed my life a lot because all of a sudden, like I'm the big man on campus. I'm a source of work, of interesting work and of money to some of my computer science and math friends. So the next thing you know, we've got 20 people working in this company and, and I'm basically deputized as the technical lead of this thing. 
And well, you know, my classes are, um, they're still, I'm, I'm still trying to take classes, but my focus is becoming more and more in this company. Um, so this was the state of affairs for about a year and a half or two years. And I started seeing that perhaps the, the relationship I had with this professor was not what I initially had thought. And that, uh, that perhaps I had, um, you know, looked at him as a father figure, not having a father figure and sort of throwing myself and all of my efforts towards this person while sort of neglecting the fundamentals, like actually paying attention to school. So by the time I was four years complete, that is a full, you know, into senior year, um, I had uh, like maybe four classes left and I was totally burnt out. And so I decided to quit college and quit, quit, um, quit this, this um, job. And so, you know, this, this, this sounds like, whoa, wait a minute, everything was going great. But, um, you know, if you don't have any guidance, you don't have people to talk about to, then uh, you can really make poor decisions very, very quickly. And, you know, with my uncle Ben, he and I had been talking on the phone my freshman year, and even I think into my sophomore year, but that I had discontinued, discontinued that. So by the time I'm at the end of my senior year, I, um, I just am making very poor decisions. So another professor is about to start up an AI slash video game company in Boston. So I've got four classes left, right? I'm like, well, screw it. I'm just not going to go anymore. I'm going to quit school. So, and I'm going to move to Boston because the, the AI professor, they were all at CMU because of just, you know, tech talent, they were going to move up to Boston. So I'm going to follow these people up, even though I never met them in my life or anything. And so my, um, my student advisor, a guy by the name of, I think, uh, Mike Dino, um, he calls me in. He's like, you know, it's not every day that, you know, a, a, a well-regarded senior just quits school. I'm like, what's up? Well, you know, I, I couldn't tell him, basically, couldn't tell him that I looked at this guy as a father figure, hadn't worked out, and I was all used up and burnt out. So uh, he says, well, you know, most people who do what you're about to do, they don't come back. You know, they don't finish their degrees. I'm like, no, sir, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So anyways, I, you know, I left that office feeling terrible, you know, thinking like, like I'm about to make a huge life, huge life uh, mistake. And in fact, it was true. So um, when I left high school to go to college, that's a very smooth transition, right? That you have all of these things set up to make a new life for these 18-year-old kids coming in, right? You have orientations, you have classes and structures, and there's parties, and there's cafeterias, and all these social um, points. Now, I moved to Boston after that. I'd been in group living situations my entire life. And I decided to get an apartment alone, you know? So um, it didn't work out. I ended up, do, so I was writing the compiler. I was a junior guy on a two-person team writing a compiler for this video game system. They're, they're, the basic AI premise was if you wrote a better computer language, then maybe the AIs and video games wouldn't suck so badly. It's a good idea. I don't know if it worked. So I was going to be one of the people writing the compiler for this thing. And for those who don't know, writing a compiler is one of the most difficult things you can do with you know, on a computer. And um, it was, you know, it's so hard. It was me, David versus the compiler every day. I had no friends. I had no support. I wasn't in touch with my family. I was living alone. I had no girlfriend. I wasn't really friendly with my with my uh, folks with with excuse me with my uh, colleagues at work. So in the span of about four months, my life just totally fell apart. I mean, like completely unraveled. I went from like the guy on campus who could get you a good job to almost like shut in territory. And so what, you know, what ended up happening is I started having panic attacks. Um, and I, I, I don't know how to say it other than if you've ever had one, you know, it's bad, right? And if you've had many, then uh, it's very, very bad. And I was very, um, not quite sure how to say it. I, I wouldn't say I was suicidal, but I was so miserable that that option seemed like at least a, a, a last resort that would end thing, end the pain, right? 
it was really bad. Um, I'm not really get doing this justice, by the way, but I was having some major uh, emotional problems. I think it was because moving to that to school, excuse me, moving to Boston really brought me back, I think, to some of the emotional issues that were happening in my earlier childhood. So um, what do I do? I call it my Uncle Ben. And, you know, he could tell I was in a, in a really, really bad way. So they, he and he and my, my aunt start taking a more, uh, a more uh, active role in my life. And I ended up moving down to New York. Uh, and I ended up getting in psych into psychotherapy, actually, like modern psychoanalysis, right? Like, talk, 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 and just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And it was exactly the right thing for me. It was so absolutely correct. Um, I was able to come to terms with some of the things that I experienced as a child. I was able to come to terms with some of the emotions that I was feeling. I, I just want to reiterate, panic attack is no smile, right? It's really bad. And to just have them, like you can become in this place where you can become afraid of having one and that gives you one. And that's when things really start to... Right. That's that's a that's a hard rut to get out of. Um, so, uh, you know, my life started picking up again. And. Um, well, I started exercising. I had never exercised like, you know, turns out it matters if your pop plays catch with you. I, no one had ever taught me any of this. Right. So I start running. I'm like, wow, that felt really good. And so I could do it again. Hey, like all, and all of a sudden it went from like, oh, I'm a little edgy and to like hey i feel great all the time so i developed this habit of running you know and so i started in, i started doing some more software engineering ended up being the cto of a startup company and then the dot com boom happened excuse me the dot com bubble burst after the boom like well everyone's going back to college so i was in manhattan and well there's columbia university right there and turns out, um, this is a good piece of advice, actually, if you want to go to school and you're willing to work full time, you can get a master's degree for free at most universities because the master's degree is a bit of a cash cow. And so if you work full time, that's real value to the university administration, systems administration, computer administration, things like this. That's how they get good people. Right. So because they don't pay well. So I went and applied into the Unix systems administrator job in the electrical engineering department at Columbia. Uh, and I got a, I got a master's degree in EE. Um, so what happened? I, I was doing that while I was finishing my my from a, from afar finishing my my four classes at Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> so um, I did end, Mark Dino. I did end, end ultimately uh, come back and finish. And as I was the, the, as I was taking these classes in the EE department, they took a really liberal approach. I mean, it's a master's degree. Like, go ahead, explore a little bit. So I ended up taking uh, some neuroscience classes and I was ultimately fascinated by the subject and I applied and I was accepted. I don't think I was, I think I might've been the last one because they, I was there at the university. Right. And like they had the, the, like all the, all the kids come, excuse me, all the students come weekend. And I wasn't, I wasn't one of the people who had been invited. And then about, you know, a month later, I get an, uh, a personal email from the department head saying, Hey Dave, we'd love if you joined us. So, um, so ultimately I got in and it, so nowadays the Columbia is known for this theory center, right? This neuro theory center, Larry Abbott, Ken Miller, Stefan Fusi, on and on and on and on, right? I had joined Carnegie, excuse me, Columbia before that had started. So I didn't really have a place to go because I was pretty clearly given my background, a, a sort of theory type of person. And so I joined a lab um, and you know, they say it takes two to tango. This person and I did not tango well together. Um, so by the end of my second year, I was contemplating doing a Fulbright scholarship in Europe to study with another uh, neuroscience mathematician person. And I got the award actually. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm at the end of my third year of a PhD program. And my uh, PhD advisor says to me, um, you know, you should think really broadly about your time in Europe, because when you return here, you won't have a lab. 
And that's uh, literally word for word how I discovered that he kicked me out of the lab. Um, so again, you know, it takes two to tango and I'm willing to take some responsibility there. Um, so I go to Europe now and I have uh, three years, sort of like, what did I do, right? Now this person just won't, kind of won't talk to me for, for about six months because he thought he was getting a connection to a data generating lab, right? And now he's got this person on the trash heap. So um, the next six months, he decides to talk to me and it starts working out. So we end up doing a little bit of research together. I return after my fourth year. Oh, by the way, I got married. Uh, so that was cool. Uh, I'm still married to this day to the same lovely woman. Um, there's a whole story there, of course, but I'm focused on the academic trajectory. Um, I returned to, to New York City at the end of my, uh, at the, yes, at the beginning, beginning my fourth year with nothing behind me, right? Like, and for those of you in a PhD program or those of you who've been through one, this is bad, right? I don't have a lab. I don't even know where I'm going. And so um, the department head at the time, he uh, reaches out to Larry, Larry Abbott, who of, of course, all of you know, I'm gonna go ahead and use Larry's name because everyone knows who my PhD advisor was anyways. Um, he reaches out to Larry. He's like, well, you know, there's this, there's this smart guy who didn't really work out with Professor X. And uh, so they have this exchange and Larry says, no, I'm not taking this guy. <laughs> and I, are you kidding me? I mean, think about it, right? Like four years, nothing to show for it. It's pretty clear that I'm a risky bet. But I think uh, I think the department head had felt that I was hard done by. And so he kept pushing Larry. And Larry says, OK, fine. So we'll do a, 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 an internship. Um, so excuse me, a rotation, right? That's the, the short internship that we do in academia. So Larry and I hit it off immediately. He's we just like just boom telekinesis waves like just going back and forth math neural networks it's just happening right so all of a sudden i'm like hey i have an idea what if we took the work that you were doing with heim sampolinski and kanika rajan on random networks and we put that over with the work from herbert jaeger on echo state machines and maybe we could get something we could learn train neural networks recurrent networks the networks that are exactly not exactly that are more like brains than just feed forward networks. And maybe if we did that, we could learn something. And so, boom, all of a sudden it worked. And it's like, oh, well, if we can train them, maybe we can understand them because now we could actually train them to do things, right? So then Omri Barak and I started wondering, could we understand how these networks are working once they're trained? And I remember I asked uh, Misha Sodex, his Omri's advisor, it's like, do you think that uh, Nonlinear dynamical systems theory, fixed points and linearizations, would that work here? No, definitely not. Okay, I wasn't, I didn't like that answer. So I asked his uh his protege, Omri, and Omri was like, Yeah, let's give it a shot. So we so Omri came up with the opposition methods and we started understanding how these trained neural networks started working for very, very simple cases. And it was, you know, it really felt like we had come up with something new. So that ultimately was a piece of my, my PhD work that was published. And because of the promise and the connections, you know, with so much of dynamical patterns in motor cortex, I ended up um, in Krishna Shinoi's lab doing a postdoc, right? And that I, the idea there was that um, the, those tools could be useful for understanding the, the really complicated neurophysiological data coming out of those, uh, those monkeys, right? So, uh, and it turned out we could make some sense of it, right? And we applied those techniques. I met Valerio Monte and Bill Newsom, and we started thinking about applying these recurrent neural network under, uh, reverse engineering techniques to uh, some of that decision-making data. And that paper came out. So all of a sudden, we were just, I felt like we were really starting to make real progress in, in the work. And all of this, you know, at the time was happening in, in, I, in a way, I've been in therapy, all of these things were just sort of coming together in my life. And, you know, it's funny because at the time that, that the, the stuff with Valerio and uh, this contextual decision making in, in prefrontal cortex or something, right? By the, the, the time that that paper was coming out, uh, one of my aunts called me up and, and uh, 
Like, you know, your father is actually going to pass away. You should come see him. And uh, I really didn't want to go see this guy. And I'm, sm I'm sort of tearful in gratitude at my aunt and uncle for pushing the issue. Uh, so I actually went and did it, you know, and I said, basically said goodbye to my estranged father as like, you know, this paper is coming out, right? So it was like this huge clash of emotions about the success and my background and all this other stuff. And ultimately when it came time to uh, make a decision about becoming a professor, I, you know, I just looked at it and it, the, the, the equation just didn't make sense to me. I mean, like, I love the research. I, I don't mind working hard. I, you know, like I'm not very excited about not making much money, but it just seemed like, you know, you make this transition and all of a sudden it's, it's grant writing and teaching and service and all these things that I'd never even been trained to do. I hadn't written a grant in my life, right? So when I looked at it, it's, I, I, I kind of got afraid and it was partially fear and partially I just didn't think the decision made sense. So I started looking around for other jobs and I ultimately ended up at, uh, at Google and in their deep learning research center, which had just Google brain as it was called, although there was not much brains in Google brain for this crowd. Um, so that's, and ultimately how I ended up in this like um, quasi uh, academic research scenario, because while I was at Google brain, I reached back out to Krishna who had now at this point by this had become a longtime collaborator of mine you know, hey, is it cool? Like, is it even a thing to become an adjunct professor? I want to keep one foot in the in the in the door, so to speak. And so um, that's kind of how I did it. And you know, I, it's kind of where I'm at now. I've processed you know, essentially everything that I've talked about today. Um, I'm I'm working partly in at Stanford as an adjunct and partly at uh, Meta Reality Labs now. And, you know, I think the key for me is just trying to make sense of, of, of the options that are on the table, right? And I, you know, I could see a world where I went back to academia if something changed about that equation for me. I could see a world where I, I left. I just, I just have to see what happens. I, I will say this, though. There has never been a better time to be in systems neuroscience, at least not that I'm aware of. Holy moly, between the data and the deep learning and the theory, I mean, the future is so bright on that. So I, I love being, however peripheral I am, I love being a part of this field. And I guess that's my story. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. I think I can talk for everyone saying very much thank you for sharing this story, which is extremely powerful. Uh, definitely it was very intense, but for sure it's your story. And thank you for that, for being so open and so honest. And definitely I leave the floor if someone has questions. Uh, I'm very happy to hear from someone. I saw already in the chat, someone already shared some thoughts. Yeah, I think Yael had a question earlier. Uh, would you like to still ask that question, Yael? You no. are muted. Yeah, I'm going to uh, unmute uh, Yael. Now. Yeah, it was so long ago, so I don't know if it's important, but I I, I mean, obviously not important. Um, thank you so much, David. This this was, <laughs> I was crying the whole time. Um, uh, super powerful and, and thank you for mentioning how psychotherapy was really helpful. I think um, it's it's amazing to normalize that. So many people feel that that's a threat rather than help. Um, I, I asked in the very beginning if you felt as a child um, guilt or kind of blamed yourself for getting into the first group home because it was because of, you know, you told it as, yeah as no. this prank I, I i ran away in that night and it's you and your sister did were you like cracked with guilt no, no. not that it was your fault but yeah no no it, yeah no i understand the question no i didn't i i i, I think my view on it was a shell shock right they're just like overwhelming processing going on that i so the short answer is no and frankly i don't know what i was feeling or thinking i, I, I sort of a fuzz if i'm being honest so no
I see there's also a question in the chat from, I'm sorry for pronouncing it for sure wrong, Susha. Uh, I don't know if you want to ask it or if I should go on. I think I will just go on. Yeah, please go on. Uh, I think you can unmute yourself. Uh, no, uh, we have to oh. do that. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me do that. Done. Okay, no microphone, I think. <laughs> oh, sorry. So I will just read it out. Um, she's asking, uh, asking, how do you now hold, in any sense, devices that saved you, whether video games or the general escapism that isn't career related? Ah, yes, I am. Um... <laughs> I still love video games. I still love video games. I um. I never lost the as some of as some of my friends here can attest. I never lost the love of a good party, um, so I'm not afraid to to party with the best of them. Uh, but you know, these days I, I definitely it's all about balance, right? So I'm um, if you if you play video games all day and, and drink all day, that's not going to get you very far. Uh, so, but yeah, no, absolutely, I I take pleasure in those things still very much so. If I understood the quick the question, and we also have one raised hand, Brian. Let me find you so I can unmute you. Everybody should be able to unmute themselves right oh, now. Ah, perfect. Uh, you can hear me. Uh, hi, David. Thanks so much. It's uh, an amazing story to hear. Um, I I wanted to ask you, or just kind of just throw this out there. Maybe you have some thoughts on it. Two of the, like the biggest features of academia professionally that I think about a lot are essentially like forced displacement or some kind of almost like, you know, a knowledge that you will have to move or be displaced multiple times professionally. And that's something you're yeah. just willing to accept, or perhaps most people even find joy in. And second is the importance of like mentor relationships, which strike me as deeply interpersonal and really kind of having to come at it with a strong sense of trust. These are two features of academia that just seem fundamentally in opposition to a, someone of your lifestyle I, oh, mean, I totally agree with that yeah so i you have to understand i got really lucky by getting kicked out of professor x's lab yeah i love larry i, I... I love larry abbott so much i'm just tearful about it um you know i, I ended up with larry and he's such a fabulous human being. Um, and, you know, we were just intellectually had a simpatico. So I didn't have that issue, right? And so Larry very quickly came to learn my story. And um, so when we decided where I was going to go, I promise you, it wasn't about who was the best uh, intellectual option. It was about who could I survive with given my background and well you know if anyone's ever met krishna shinoi uh he's an amazing human being a truly amazing human being so i um got lucky and then started planning around it right and with respect to the to the forced moving i think that's also true um with the exception that i was married and so i had a, a nuclear core that was very very strong that supported me Thank you very much. We have another question from the chat from Julie. And the question is, um, I'm interested now to learn how do you approach your mentorship now, given your experiences, if at all you bring it with you? Yes, that is a great question. I um, I think it's fair to say I care about more about mentorship than any other aspect of the job that I'm in. Um, I. I don't understand how people give this portion of the job short shrift. I don't get it. Um, it's just, it's just not who I am. So, um, you know, given some of the extreme things that I experienced at a child, as a child, I think that there's, there's typically a point where I'm like, Hey, you know, like I keep it all 
you know, on the DL. And then at some point, you know, there's a breakthrough and I, I mention it, you know, uh, so that usually engenders a little bit of additional sharing. I, I'm obviously very careful about that. Here I am on this thing, actually. <laughs> but no, I, I really, really care about the mentorship. And I don't know what to say other than, yes, my background had an enormous impact on this. Because, you, you know, you look around, people don't succeed or fail because somebody taught them how to do a triple integral, right? That's not what's going on. People succeed or fail because other people believe in them, right? Other people give them opportunities. Other people put them in places to fail in, in a good way, right? Give them chances. And so my approach to mentorship is some combination of just, you know, mimicking Larry and Krishna and, you know, bringing my own thing from my childhood, from, from my own experiences is a better way to say it. Thank you very much. We also have another question here. So first of all, thanks a lot for sharing, they say, and sorry, I'm missing my screen. We do now work in both in academia and industry. How difficult or helpful do you find it? Uh, I'm curious to know um, why this is not so common. Um, yeah, why is this not so common? um you have to negotiate for it right um so let me let me take that question in the the way in the direction in the in the order that you asked it um i get a huge kick out of being both in corporate research and academic research in corporate research the the impact it can be it just enormous but it's much more short term right it's the the work is far more collaborative you know I, I manage a team of 20 people there's people everyone knows what everyone else is doing can you imagine that in, a, in an academic lab right that's it's just not the standard right so things are more short-term they're more collaborative they're more short-term impactful in academia you can really take the long vision as long of course as you can get somebody to give you a grant money for for whatever you're thinking about and uh, that provides its own set of opportunities. Most of the problems that I like to think about, frankly, like if somebody else can go do it in a couple of months, then why? You know, I, I am not afraid to take big swings at the plate and, and strike out. Uh, you know, I'm just not. And occasionally you might hit a home run. So, so that's my mentality there. Um, and with respect to why aren't more people doing it? I think because... Um, at least in neuroscience, other, other disciplines do do it, right? But in neuroscience has never really been a money-making proposition. And it's only now through the lens of brain-machine interfaces or either that or molecular stuff, right? That you could actually do that crossover. So I think there's just a historical thing. And I think you have to be able to negotiate for it, right? So that's what I did. Um, you know, I have some visibility in neuroscience. And when I when I talked to the folks at Meta, I said, hey, this is this is what I want to do. And they agreed to it. So I would definitely um, encourage you to know what you want in the negotiation. Right. And because once you're signed, you're signed. Thank you so much. We are a bit running out of time, but I think there's one last question that uh, maybe you can address. And it's from Tessa and asking how would you suggest going about finding mentorship as someone who comes from similar circumstances yeah oof uh, i'll tell you this it matters um you know i got kicked out of one lab <laughs> and i did really well in another so um i think you i think you have to sample it right i think there's also the other thing that's going on is when I got it, I, by the time I was in my PhD, I was already a couple years into therapy. So I was much more mindful about who, what, what I was bringing to a situation. I was much more intentional about how I was interacting with people. I didn't have fantasies about finding a father figure. I didn't have fantasies about finding a mother figure. I was extremely intentional about what I wanted to get out of those relationships. And honestly, you know, there was some success and some failure. Um, I think you'd have to sample around and, you know, uh, there are whisper networks, right? Like you can talk to people, 
right? You can find out what people think about other other um, other professors, and I would take you know you, you know use your judgment about your in in your prioritization. It will never be about getting that you know fourth uh, patch clamp recording instead of the third one. It will never be about the triple integral or writing this amazing piece of code that that your advisor showed you how to do. It will always be about what those opportunities and mentorship and teaching that the, that the that the that the mentors bring. And you just have to sample and ask. And beyond that, I don't really know what to say. Thank you very, very much. Uh, for a matter of time, we unfortunately have to close this session. I mean, I think we could all listen to you for a very, very long time still, sure. but thank you. Yeah, I think we may have, I think we should may have. Uh, Vero, Vero may have dropped out, but thank you very much, David, uh, also from my point of view. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, the next Grand Prix Science Global event will be in two weeks. It's going, going to be about writing anti-racist recommendation letters. Hope to see you then as well. Take care. Bye-bye, yeah. all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for listening.